Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Monday evening. Welcome to another episode of Raw, Fresh, Natural, and Live. Uh, and I'm Dr. Baxter Montgomery, your local cardiologist. And we have a special guest tonight, another cardiologist. You can, you're going to have two cardiologists on one show tonight. And uh, uh, a colleague and friend of mine who uh, practices on the West Coast, and he's going to be sharing some insights in terms of how he manages patients using natural lifestyle method. So I hope your week is uh, getting off to a great start. We have a great show uh, for you tonight, and we're going to have a natural conversation uh, about lifestyle management of patients with heart disease. And he's also going to talk to us about his special docuseries that's coming on pretty soon. Uh, but I'd like to introduce our usual panel. Uh, first and foremost is our resident nutritionist, uh, Isosa Adosawam, uh, AKA Raw Girl. Uh, Isosa is a nutritionist and lifestyle uh, management person. She has a clientele that's international that she coaches on a regular basis. Welcome, Isosa. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you. And uh, our next uh, regular panelist is Dr. Floyd Atkins. Dr. Atkins is a uh, a uh, counselor in natural health. He's a uh, specialist in podiatry and a former foot surgeon. And he decided to retire from that area to counsel patients in lifestyle management and natural health uh, disease reversal. And he also co-manages the Center for Wellness and Healing, Healing here in Houston, Texas, along with uh, Pam Atkins, Dr. Atkins, is trained in family medicine and also functional medicine. And she is the medical director of the Center of Wellness and Healing here in Houston. And uh, she and Dr. Ford Atkins manage patients in natural approaches uh, to disease. So hello guys, how are you doing? Doing great. Doing great. I hope your weekend went well. Mine was busy as usual. Uh, my Monday started out pretty busy. I don't know, anybody get any rest over the weekend? Yes. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. All right. So at least I remember. So how are you? At least some of us are following our advice, right? <laughs> no, I, I did get some rest this weekend, so I better. Well, anyway, let me bring on our guest. Uh, uh, Dr. Columbus uh, Batiste is a board-certified interventional cardiologist and assistant clinical professor at the University of California Riverside School of Medicine. Uh, since 2008, he has served as the chief of cardiology over the years. Dr. Batiste's been recognized for his work by multiple organizations. Uh, in 2011, uh, he led an establishing uh, led an establishing the Integrative Cardiovascular Disease Program, which sought to prevent the reoccurrence of cardiac events through lifestyle intervention. In 2018, Dr. Pease worked with Samsung Electronics to develop a technology-driven virtual cardiac rehab lifestyle program which has successfully treated over 5,000 patients via a virtual care delivery model. And I'd like for him to talk to us about that. Uh, he's active through his nonprofit organization, Healthy Heart Nation, to share information about the benefits of plant-based nutrition, daily exercise, and stress reduction. Dr. Peace is currently collaborating on an initiative to create a docu-series entitled Slave Food, which explores the relationship between stress weaponization of food and health disparities in minority communities. Without further ado, welcome. Dr. Tease, how are you doing, Columbus? I'm well, I'm well, good to be here. Good well, to see welcome. all of you. Yeah, welcome to the show. And, um, you know, it's gonna be an exciting conversation. I'm looking through your uh, bio, uh, a couple of things jump out at me and, and, and I'd like to just get your take on the, your virtual, uh, uh, you know, wellness uh, program, a virtual cardiac rehab program, you know, it, it's, I mean, you guys, you know, started working on this in 2018. Did you uh, anticipate uh, the COVID pandemic also? Were you? <laughs> yeah. Did you foresee? My, nick my, my, my nickname is Nostradamus. So oh, okay. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> I mean, I mean, I, I couldn't be more point on, but t tell us how, well, let me just let you back up. I mean, obviously we want to hear about this, but, but, First of all, tell us your journey, your health journey, life journey to some extent. It's, I mean, the Sunday is on your website and it's quite interesting, but, but why don't we start there and, and kind of walk us through where, how you got to this point? Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and appreciate it. You know, I'm the youngest of five kids. I call myself the uh, pleasant surprise uh, that happened. My, my <laughs> eldest sibling is 16 years older than I am. So I was oh, indeed wow. the pleasant, pleasant surprise to say the least. 
You sure I'm was like, good? <laughs> <laughs> I'm go I'm going I'm going there. That was good. I, I'm gonna live in that belief system right there. That was wonderful. <laughs> no, I'm just so, kidding. So, uh, well, you, uh, needless to say, you're not the first or the last with that one there. <laughs> and and growing up, you know, my parents, you know, they came out the era where education is everything. And so my dad basically said, are you going to be a doctor? Are you going to be a lawyer or business person? That was really basically it. And so I set off on this trajectory to become a doctor, even though growing up in Compton, California, you know, I didn't know any black physicians. All I knew were the physicians I would go to and I would see, and I had a good, good uh, interaction with them, but I didn't know any. So I went in blind, but I believe it was my destiny to kind of be where I'm at right now because coming out like any true blue Californian. I wanted to be the Lakers team doctor is what I wanted to do coming out of high school and going into college. I was going to take care of Magic Johnson, Kareem, all the subsequent Lakers. But as, as things would unfold, my second year of college, I went to historically black college and university. I did an externship, a rotation at the University of Virginia. And I, I found this magnificent African-American cardiologist where I was just awestruck and I fell in love with the heart. It just seemed to make sense. We just connected on this like cellular level and that was all she wrote. And I remember writing inside my graduation book from uh, uh, college that I wanted to go on and become the chief of cardiology at UCLA was my ultimate goal. And so, you know, fast forward, I was very blessed in getting into cardiology and I always knew that I wanted to do something else in terms of within cardiology about lifestyle and prevention to some degree, even though being an interventional cardiologist, my job was to stop a heart attack in his throes with placing stents and doing some other fancy procedures. And uh, so that's that's kind of how I, I, I moved inside the professional realm. Now, in terms of lifestyle, what, really what happened was that the, my same, the dad who took care of me along with my mom, I never forget, you know, he did everything for us. He was educated, had his master's, he taught college, he worked as a probation officer. He did whatever he had to do to kind of hustle and put us through private school. And I remember one summer kind of going out and coming home and he would paint curbs. He would paint the curbs to put the numbers on homes to get extra money. And I never forget, like my dad was telling me one time, you know, I would to come with him, I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed of this man who kind of got down on his hands and knees being a diabetic, right? And we all know what happens to di diabetics, right? Uh -huh. the, the parts of their body that's affected, this is another reason why it was a pleasant surprise. Nothing firsthand knowledge, but me knowing the ill effects of diabetes that ravages a person's body throughout their life, there's certain things that they become less capable of doing. And so my dad had trouble standing up, but I was embarrassed. Huh. And so fa fast forward additionally that I remember my dad being proud still and joking with my sisters and saying, you know, you know, they say, well, dad, why are you going to tell Columbus about whatever? He said, well, this is my son. He's a doctor. He has my best interests at heart. And so after my dad, we all have a story. All I'm sure all of us have a story. And after my dad passed, I remember going into this deep hole of like really just like thinking I had completely missed the mark and how I had failed him. Not only when he asked for my help when he was painting curbs to fund my college tuition, but when he needed me most in the time of his tragedy, I failed him most. And so I went into this whole, this kind of recess of really struggling and trying to figure out what, what did I miss? Yeah, I'm board certified internal medicine doctor, general cardiologist, interventional cardiologist. I'm, I'm ascending to the chief of the department and people are thanking me for saving their lives and I could do nothing for the person who I loved, he and my mom, the most along with my wife and my kids at that time. And so I remember reading and stumbling on uh, Cobble Esselstyn's book. Dude, how did your dad die? I'm sorry, how did, how did he pass? He, he, so he had diabetes and just diabetes ravished his body and just let one thing to the other. The honest truth is this, you, really, you asked the question, what really happened was that my dad was a proud man. He loved to dress up. Mm -hmm. And so I remember buying him these fancies and they were, he needed me to put his braces on so he can keep himself from having the peripheral neuropathy and the foot drop. Mm -hmm. And so because of the neuropathy, he, was not, he wasn't ever able to feel 
the brace rubbing against his foot, causing an infection. Mm. And so after that point, he ended up being recumbent in bed. Mm -hmm. And we know when you stop moving, that's a forebearer of what's going to happen in the future. That's and right. he began to spiral down after that point. Mm. So, so from my perspective, you can imagine what I carry with what I carry with me in terms of not my my lack of disdain for getting down on my knees, my inability to help him in his greatest time, and then also spurring on his rapid descent by the purchase of those shoes. Oh wow. Mm. And so and so and so coming out of this with this heavy burden on me, the thing that I had to do in this moment was really search. And so that's when I started just reading. You know, oftentimes us as physicians and healthcare providers and professionals, we search for we have an analytical mind and trying to look and ration, rationalize things and try and figure out what did I miss and go back to the basics. <laughs> and so the one area that was a gaping deficiency in my life and in my training was that of nutrition and lifestyle. And as I stumbled and I read upon the various aspects in detail, and I had started to read and dibble and dabble on things because patients were asking me before, but I would just pick any doctor's book off the shelf from Barnes and Nobles. And I would say little arbitrary quote quips and say like, uh, just, just, just be good most of the time. Do well four out of seven. You don't even love your wife four out of seven, it's seven out of seven days. Four out of seven is pretty good. You know, I would say silly things like this. Oh no. Hor horrible things like this. And so when I, when I fell into really understanding what was going on and reading the book, the chapter that left out at me was moderation kills. Moderation kills because that is what distinctly characterized my dad's life. He didn't smoke, he didn't drink, he didn't do drugs, he didn't do he didn't eat excessive amounts of animal products, but he did eat fair amounts of standard American diet of sweets and processed foods, and he loved in that acclimation. And what struck me hold was the fact that we never know what amount is going to be detrimental to our own bodies. So when I prescribe pills, and, and, and we all know this, I give one person a dose of a beta blocker, it's very smallest dose possible, and they're horribly intolerant. Mm -hmm. Another person, I have to raise the dose to the maximum level and add additional therapy on, on top um, when I'm looking at pharmacology. And so the dose is specific to the individual according to how their body processes it. Mm -hmm. And so that was the one thing that, that left out of me. And that was really the start of my journey and mm -hmm. the transformation. And one thing led to the other when, uh, when I became completely entrenched in recognizing that I needed to deliver this message. And this is before the days of StreamYard and my knowledge of you and others and YouTube and so forth. So I was hesitant about getting out, right? I mean, I'm an interventional cardiologist where you make your earnings and you get your reputation by doing more and more complex things, not by telling people to eat plants. Yes. Right. And then on top of it, I was one of the only few black cardiologists I knew at that time. I was the only one in my area. I didn't know of any other black cardiologist within a, a 60 mile radius. So I didn't want to be that guy. That is he a quack? Is there something wrong with him? And I remember just being hesitant. And I finally just said, you know what? I can't let my life, my dad's life mean nothing. Right. Uh -huh. And so I just started telling people. And I'll I'll be honest, I wasn't very polished. I didn't have a I didn't have an elevator pitch to them in that moment in my clinic. I just gave them basic information. That's why it's so powerful from physicians to just direct people in the right and put them and point them in the right direction by giving them words of encouragement that you can do this, of this is what's possible. So the first three people I told this and I gave them information, they had phenomenal outcomes. All I did was give them books to read. All I did is tell them that they could do it. And all of a sudden I was backing off their medications. I had other docs telling me, and, and that was the beginning of the journey. And that was the beginning of the springboard into really practicing more of a lifestyle approach and trying to integrate it from the inside of my organization. You know, it's an amazing story. I can identify with it because, um, you know, I tell my story about my mom and it was on her deathbed where this sort of sprung me into this area. So 
I, I, uh, I understand where you're coming from. That's, that's a very beautiful story. I can, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing. I'm sure your dad's looking down, smiling on you. So it's, it's never really a loss. Sometimes it's meant to be that our parents get us to this point by whatever means necessary. So, so after that, so you started, were you with Kaiser at the time or were you? Oh, yeah. So, so you, been- so you just started delivering this message um how was it you say you weren't polished initially and the like um how did your colleagues receive it what i mean was there you know uh what, what was the response to the people around you, your co- professionals and colleagues you know i think it's like everything else you know when the first time you get up and you speak about a subject matter in front you're more worried about everyone else than they are about you <laughs> you know, yeah. and the reality of the reality of it is, is that we're not. We think that we think all we are is we're we're supporting actors and everyone else's story, right? Sure. We're, yeah. we're just a we're a back we're we're a bystander, but we think we're so important that all eyes are on us, and that's not the case. And so, really, my colleagues didn't have any. They didn't say anything negative at all. But to the contrary, over time and fast forward now. 12 years into doing this, 10, 10, 12 years into doing this, they actually point people in my direction. They speak to patients about nutrition, whether they're fully behind plant-based or not, um, and whole food plant-based rather, I should characterize. They will refer them to my cooking classes and to my lecture series too as well. And so it's a complete dichotomy from what I thought was going to transpire to what has transpired over the period of time. Wow. Wow. And so it's grown. So, so now walk us through this. I mean, I'm reading through your bio. I mean, you've done these incredible things. Um, you know, so, and, and what year was that you started delivering this message? So bring us back in time. So your dad, your dad passed what year was it? My dad, my dad got deathly sick in 2009. And so it was around that time that I started to really kind of look and, and get into all of this. And then he passed officially. It'll be 10 years this upcoming August, 12. Wow, wow. So so 2000, so in 2011, you started the, the Establishing Integrated Cardiovascular Disease Program. So I guess that sprung from your dad's passing. And so now, and then of course, 2018, you've done this wonderful digital work with uh, Samsung Electronics. So kind of bring us there. So from 2011, 2018, uh, how did things evolve in that period of time? And then tell us about the the uh, the digital uh, platform. Yeah, no, absolutely. So, I mean, I started searching. I went and I spent time. I spent time with the likes of Kyle Esselstyn. I spent time with others around the way, kind of learning and absorbing how they develop and deliver the message. And I crafted my own voice. Mm-hmm. And I went ahead and I started using my own um, vacation time to deliver the to start doing what I call the missing link lecture series. And I, I walk patients through what traditional therapy is, but then the power of lifestyle, both nutrition, activity, stress reduction, water, and various aspects there. And it was widely, well, it was widely received. I actually had physicians who would attend, pharmacists who attended to as well, and started giving that and started giving them a full packet. And then the requests of the patients were like, well, what's next? You know, we want something else. And so I start, I collaborate with a dietitian and started doing a cooking class. And that cooking class I entitled the cath lab. The cath lab is that place that we bring patients to in order to, to perform procedures. The goal of the cath lab is to stop a heart attack in his throes. The goal of the cath lab is to reestablish the openness of the vessels to so chest pain can go away heart failure symptoms can resolve. And so I felt it was it was a it was a well suited name, the cath lab, for what I was doing, cooking alternative to health. Now the only error in what I was saying as alternative, alternative alternative implies to me somehow less than, somehow secondary. When okay. in reality it should be the primary source. It should be the first line. And whereas the other therapy should only be at the very tail end when we can when for those few patients who, who fall out. And um so that was well received. I brought this dietitian into my practice because in my training, I learned that you wanted to have smoking cessation providers immediately there working out of the Veterans Administration Hospital and other places so you can capture that individual in that moment. They don't have to come back. And so my intent was let's bring a dietitian in so we can mimic that. And in that moment, when I have a captive audience, I have them see my dietitian and we move them over. And that was a big feat, but I was able to do it. 
within moving around dollars and cents within the organization. So we're the only site within our organization that has a dietitian that sits within the cardiology department. Let me ask you about uh, the dietitian. I'm sorry. Did you have to retrain that? I mean, when I worked in my setting, when I bring in dietitians, I mean, many of them are trained in the traditional meat and cheese industry. What, what was your experience with your dietitians? Well, I was very intentional. So I brought her in because she was the one I worked with. I knew she was whole food plant-based okay. and I knew that she, I worked with her doing the cooking sessions. So that's where I created a budget and she was willing and able to come over and she joined us. So you got the dietitian uh, lottery ticket there, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> no, Dr. Baxter, he, he's in California. We're in Texas, remember? Oh. <laughs> that's, a, that's a good point. That's a really good point. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the, the hey, before we go on, one of the pause, I want to bring Dr. Celeste Palmer in. Uh, she had some emergency to deal with, but she's able to join us. Uh, hello, Celeste. How are you doing? Welcome to the show. And uh, I know you may have heard some of the backstage, but uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Batiste is uh, carrying us through his life journey and professional journey. So. So now you, you've got the cath lab forum, you've got the, the dietitian uh, uh, in place. And so now you were able to set your own budget. Was it much red tape? I mean, you're within Kaiser. Were they pretty uh, uh, open to your, you know, creating these programs? <clears throat> were they supportive? So, well, yes, I, I mean, absolutely. Yes, they are. But I have been doing it for a little bit of time and I have the support of my nurse leave with me that we were able to to accentuate all the aspects, still cover the basic needs of general cardiology and ensuring our access and service and quality and so forth. And the thought was, is that this is going to add to the quality. This is going to keep patients well, which is what the, the basis of our found of our our medical group is based on. Um, so it worked out. It worked out well. And and historically, I wasn't the first department to ever do this. So it wasn't as if I was saying a precedent from that standpoint, which also was something in my favor. Um, but just with my specific intention of doing the, the having a plant-based di dietitian and platform. And then I collaborated with a psychologist to bring them on. We all, as we all know, it's, it's a struggle for, for folks to get over in terms of a lot of their, their issues that they may have and some of their cultural aspects and the things that they're, they're tied to. So we brought that in. And these are all components of cardiac rehab. So cardiac rehab has always been important, and so I, we established, that was one of the first things I did when I, I took on the administrative role because of the lifestyle component. And what I realized is that we could not tend to all the cardiac patients who were inside of our city limits or our, what we call service area and our county area. And so I knew we had to do something different. And there was no way that there was going to be another bricks and mortar that was built. So I started doing some research and around that time, Mayo Clinic came out with information about their their entry into the area there, trying to see if they could do a, a virtual cardiac rehab. And I saw, I found through research, Europe had been doing it for years. Canada had been doing it for the year, for years. The VA was doing it. And I said, hey, let's do it. So I called up some friends who were, who were in the uh, inside of the uh, professional IT world and I'm giving them my pitch. They were like, oh Columbus, that sounds good, but I don't know. And so I was getting doors shut in my face. And I said, you know what? We're just gonna do it old school. We're gonna do it old school. We're gonna call the patients, we're gonna bring them in, we're gonna assess them. We will go ahead and we'll have our case managers call them on a weekly basis and put a full program uh, together and we'll do a graduation at the end and give them all the resources. Wow. We started that, we started that got approval, it went well, we improved our, our access. Then there was an opportunity that Samsung, and I can speak to this now, I normally don't like to speak to specifically within KP's info when I do these, but it's it's grown in size now that we're actually up to close to 10,000 patients. Wow. That Sam, Samsung approached us really about collaboration. And they had multiple physicians all come and present their their case to them. And I'm gonna tell you how things work, right? So I had I always say yes when it comes to any community event, I, unless there's a birthday or issue with my kids, I will say yes. And so I was doing an event and I specifically was going through some information that was germane to cardiac rehab. So without knowing that it was, they were giving like TED-like talks, I went in there and we were able to pitch it, they bought it, and we went and de designed a complete program on the virtual platform with the Samsung watch to, mem to emulate what a person's experience is going through cardiac rehab um, in person. 
And so that was successful. And the organization, they, they funded the pilot and then they agreed to pitch it. And that's how we took off. And, and now we're doing this all throughout all of Southern California, Kaiser Permanente. And as you mentioned earlier, the timing couldn't have been better. It was meant to be because when COVID hit, a lot of places had to regress from the important care and it still is in that situation now. So technologies like this in our program are so valuable in this time. Wow, that's amazing, that's amazing. Now you, you um, uh, the other item I wanna to get to, you run a nonprofit organization, Healthy Heart Nation. Um, tell us about that. Well, as a platform, very similar. It's just, you know, I what I recognized clearly was, you know, growing up in Compton, I never thought about it. I used to like spending time with my, my dad and my mom and so, I never forget that I would get in the back of his black Marquise car and I'd sit in the back of this big old car and we'd go to the grocery store. And I never forget like going that we would drive and drive and drive. And as a kid, I remember liking this, I would enjoy watching the lights go by. We would drive about 20, 25 miles. And I remember walking through the grocery store and the lights were bright and you'd see the rows of fruit and the vegetables all look gorgeous. It never struck me till I got older. The reason why my dad drove that far was because we lived in the food desert. We uh. lived in the food desert. We lived in the food swamp. And we had to drive out in order to get health promoting foods to any degree. And so that became obviously an issue, a burden of mine. And so around that time, I realized there was that issue. Then I also realized that the information that I was giving to patients that different ethnic groups I would have to tell it, I'd have to tailor it differently. So if they were Filipino patients or if they were South Asians and, and uh, Indian and, and, and if they were African-American, I might have to kind of give information that resonated with them. And so one of the things that I, I sought out to accomplish was to giving very specific, ethnically specific information and in continuing in terms of my, uh, my lecturing around in various locations, but doing that through the form of written work, through digital media. And ultimately what I've realized is the fact that a lot of patients have, have been victims of society where they've moved towards not reading, that they, they get their information by listening to podcasts and watching wonderful outlets like this and watching documentaries. And so that became a passion of mine of saying, how can I deliver this information in a culturally specific way, fashion that gives people the real information that's scientific and historical. And that was really the birth child of the nonprofit because it's not, I have a day job as I, as I like to say, I have yeah. a day job and I could not do any of this and I still get paid very, uh, very well, you know, but there's a greater point to my life and, and I have a greater responsibility for things I haven't done in, in the past. And so that's what was the birthplace of, of Healthy Heart Nation to really go ahead and seek to do that. Wow, this is impressive. You know, um, what I really want to get into is uh, this major project you've undertaken, uh, this docu-series uh, entitled Slave Food. Uh, what I'd like to do is before we get into that, I want to play the, um, uh, for our audience, I want to play the, um, the trailer for that. So why don't we take a look at the trailer for Slave Food, and then we'll get into your discussion on that. Okay. Our greatest gift I can give to my kids is the gift of knowledge, the gift of health. So in that way, I can transform their epigene, that, that trigger, that light switch, that trigger that's gonna determine, do they have to have disease or not? This does not have to be your story. And it's not to tell you that you're gonna live forever, that there's never gonna be an end. There's a beginning and an end, but the question is, how are those final chapters gonna be written in your book? Slave food is food that was refused by those in power. It's the stuff nobody else wanted that the slave then had to figure out a way to make taste good and to try and sustain life on. It's the manipulation of nutrition for profit and for power. Slave food is really about answering that really quintessential question. Why do black people in America die sicker and sooner than everyone else? The most common habit really is processed food, of eating food. They use food essentially as a way of de-stressing of, of anti-anxiety or antidepressants, how food is really now used in order to kind of medicate to get a sense of feeling better. So, I mean, it's well documented that 
the majority of diseases that people of color suffer from are directly related to what they eat, right? We know that. So on the converse, we can combat them by what we eat. Every seven minutes, there's a premature death. It's pretty staggering. It's overwhelming that we are dying sicker and sooner than everyone else at these rates. Why does this happen from the idea of stress? Mm -hmm. It can be life stressors, but also the idea really about really this unique idea of a racial discriminatory stress that plays an impactful role in the manifestation of disease. Stress is powerful because stress is something you feel on a very 30,000 foot level, like an airplane up in the sky, but it manifests itself on a cellular level. So you feel it macroscopically, but it actually manifests microscopically. But food is important because food is the only way you can actually reverse that stress. In terms of the African-American experience and African-American community, really it, it dates back to the, the origin. Western Africa and that, that surge arc over into the Americas, inside the Caribbean, inside of South America. That middle passage that was there where food had to be rationed. Food was a method of power, slave food, that's been processed, chemically modified, in order to get the, the greatest bliss point or, or engagement. The food swamp is, is just is, is, is flooding our neighborhoods with calories. That's really the swamp. It's a, it's a swamp of, 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 of nutrient-poor, calorie-dense, low-cost foods in areas where people don't make a lot of money. So you go into poor neighborhoods and there's no grocery store, no real grocery store with, that's clean and produces fresh and it's replaced on a very regular basis. Everything we eat, every time we eat is an investment in our longevity, in our health. It either is making you healthier or it's making you sicker. African Americans uh, globally, specifically in the United States, have this sense that my mom had it, my dad had it. I'm not gonna live to a certain age. I'm gonna get diabetes. I'm going to have a stroke. I'm gonna have it. And so it's destiny. And what I want folks to know is that it's not destiny. Your DNA is not your destiny. That's powerful. So, um, so I want to give everybody a taste of, of the concept and, and, and looking at that trailer, it, it's pretty clear that you are going through multiple dimensions of the aspects of food. I mean, granted, we can look at it at the superficial nutritional biochemical level of how food can be harmful to our health, but there's also a, a psychological component to it. And there's a so psychosocial aspect of it, of how food enslaves us, you know, that play on words, you know, the food we had during, you know, our slavery of our, of our people, our ancestors, but then there's a present day enslavement to the food and the illnesses that the food brings on. Uh, speak to that. What, what led to this and kind of walk, walk us through this process? I mean, it's, it's quite an enlightening process. Uh, yeah, no, you know, I'll, I'll tell you, like I mentioned, you know, this was a, an area of passion. And so starting, obviously, I'm African American, as everyone on earth can see. And so I felt that that was extremely important to start with people who look like me. And well, some of the one know, you just told us, so now we know. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. But, you know, so so I wanted to I wanted to really kind of approach it. I love history from the historical perspective. My partner, Eric Walsh, who, by the way, has lost about 90 pounds since engaging on a whole food plant based and getting rid of the standard American diet style, vegan, whatever else that's out there. Right. Yeah. Which is really what we're speaking to. And so and so he brings in the social justice, the public health component. And so when we looked and we really sat down, we were actually at a dinner table with uh, former graduates of ours from uh, our college. And this, this lawyer said, man, what's the deal with black people? Why am I, oh, why, how come I'm having to get a prostate check, my colonoscopy, than my other colleagues? No one else is having to get this stuff done. And that was really the birthplace of why do we die sicker and sooner? Not you die sicker and sooner, but why do we die sicker and sooner? 
And so really looking at the layered approach of why, what goes into this, the stress, the level of discrimination that's there, whether or not it's a microaggression, right? I, I don't know about you, Baxter. I remember I've, I've had numerous times that people will confuse me with someone else. Doesn't matter what my title is in the hospital. And people always wonder, why are you always, why you wear a tie and a white coat so, so laced up? It's because people will, will assume I'm someone else. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I understand that. No, that, that happened frequently. And, and, and one thing I can attest to when I was in medical school, just to, to, to uh, piggyback on your comment, is, uh, you know, at, at UTMB and University of Texas Medical Branch in Galveston here in Texas, we had a prison hospital. And so mm. when I rotated through the prison hospital, I mean, it was, I mean, we would, the, the, the patient rooms were actually cells and the guard would have to let you in. It was a, do you know I identified with the prisoners more mm. so than I did with my classmates? It was just, I mean, I would do an H and P and a young guy looked like me, similar background. Mm. And it was, I, I mean, it was a strange thing, but it, I had a sense of, closeness, a greater sense of closeness to the prisoner than I had with my classmates, most of whom were, were Caucasian. It was a weird thing, and but but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, no, I mean, that's huge, and that's what, that's what things are doing. Yeah, so I so the level, the, oh, the level, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. Turn, can you turn your um, turn your mic down? Uh, turn your speaker down. Uh, How's it? Can you turn your speaker down? Yeah, there we go. How's yeah, that? Is that yeah. If you turn your speaker around, that might help. You say what's that? If you turn your speaker tomorrow, that might help uh, with the feedback. I'll turn it all the way off. I'll just turn it real low. When you're speaking, not when you can see it, but so hear it, but sometimes. Is that better? It is. It is. Okay, right. go ahead. So, right. yeah. so basically what we ended up doing is we came together and once we centered on the stress the discrimination and we find that African American actually, when, well, first let me start. When you're stressed, we know your two pairs are shorter. We know you're more likely to have disease, period. And that's all ethnic groups. That's been shown. When you're African American and you perceive racial discrimination, your telomeres, which are which predict the length of your life, right? That they're shorter. When you perceive racial discrimination, the occurrence of in housing increases. Breast cancer increases just by having those. And we know many times you know, that when stress goes desserts. That's right. People turn to when they're depressed. They turn to when they're depressed. That's right. So, and that lends itself to the idea of nutritional stress. That then impacts everything well, exactly right. from the top to the bottom. It's it's so so you can I'm like red. I was like, we unfold this whole process of nutrition to people and really kind of walk them through how it's going to be. And this, in combination, like this, a role in why they're getting now, gotcha, gotcha. Very simple. We started this project several years ago. But with COVID, we're seeing this whole entire thing play out. Now, see, now that's exactly right, and I, I, I wanted, to, I wanted to dig into that psychological aspect. Come, do me a favor. Will you? Uh, Come out and come back in the studio, and maybe that'll correct the problem. And while you go out and come back in, I'm asking Sosa to comment. You do a lot of behavioral counseling with Sosa, and um, the psychological aspect of things. Can you share with us your experience and your thoughts in terms of the psychological aspects of food, and and and, and how some of the things that uh, Columbus is sharing with us may play into that? Um. I'm just checking because a lot of people are saying that I'm sorry. I don't think that 
anyone can hear me because I think there's feedback overall. Yeah, is that feed? Are y'all getting feed? Because when I talk, I'm, I'm mine is clear. We're getting it from you, so I think that there's something going on with the speaker, or um, okay. something's happening. Let me do this. Okay, how's that? Is that better? No. Yes. How's that, Thomas? Is that better? Are you getting feedback now? It's better than what it was when I was on. I think it's a little better. I think it's, it's a, a little, little better. better. Okay, let me do. I'm gonna do one other little thing. Like the I'm gonna change. The voice has changed, so I'm not yeah. sure. <laughs> you sound like you should be blurred out, Baxter, and that you're giving like yes. a you sound like you should minute. be in the hip hop album, like a new age. <laughs> Wait, uh, how's that now? Is that better? It's still yeah. a little echoey, but how's that? I change speakers. Okay. It, it helps to not have the dogs in the background. I, I guess Columbus has the dogs. No. The dogs. No, I heard I dogs know. barking. Nobody. That's some of the feedback. Now, is that now? I heard dogs barking. Okay. <laughs> Am I coming across okay now? Oh. Columbus, you found it better. So why don't you go ahead and continue? Okay. Okay. Um, you wanted me to talk about behavioral coaching. Well, just uh, touch into so Columbus is touching into some of the issues, of the psychological aspects of food, and uh, I hope I'm not giving too much echo. But, 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 but the, the psyche of food, in terms of let's say there's a perceived stress in your life, whether it's a perceived racial stress or some other issue, um, we then turn to food uh, from the standpoint of of treating that uh, external stress. Um, Speak to that first, and what I want to do is kind of look at the other side in terms of how, if if we consume the right type of food, it should directly help us deal with the outside stress. But let's let's look at the other way: how we deal with the outside stress, consuming perhaps the wrong kind of food, and 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 maybe come come at it from that angle. Sure. So the when I talk when I get into the subconscious mind, I go very deep. <laughs> Um, when, when we're talking about just general relationship to food, it usually gets formed when we're younger. Um, and a lot of times people either create this relationship where there's a reward, like even if they were just really happy and every single time they had a great moment, their parents bought them ice cream then all of a sudden it becomes this, like, I need sugar. Um, whenever I have a great moment or I'm just rewarding myself. Right. I mean, the brain operates with we always want to form habits using rewards. So I use this with my clients all the time. Sometimes I have to change what the reward is in order to get them to do this new thing. So there's that relationship where when it becomes emotional, then there's the other opposite where someone can, um, and it's a natural thing to do. It's almost, it's, I mean, it's, it's basically just substituting drugs. It's the same thing as you would do with the drug. You're doing it with food. You're basically going, I feel really horrible right now. Um, so I'm gonna eat a piece of cake and I'm gonna get a sugar rust. I'm gonna feel great for a moment. And then I'm gonna come crashing down. I'm gonna feel really horrible again. And then I'm gonna eat another piece of cake. And then the next thing you know, you're in one of you guys is in my office talking about your weight gain or whatever your problem is, right? So there's, you can have either or, and when someone, there's, there's, there has to be a really delicate approach when people have almost borderline eating disorder like behavior. It's really not, you really do have to kind of get to the root cause. I'm always trying to encourage mindfulness at that point. Like you need to stop, figure out what you're actually feeling, express the emotion, and then from there pivot. Because now you, you're becoming aware. This was a subconscious habit at the beginning. But now, um, now it's a conscious habit that you know, okay, whenever I'm angry and my boss talks to me crazy, or Becky gives me that little microaggression, I'm going to feel like I need some ice cream. And so I'm going to stop. I'm going to breathe. I might phone a friend. I might go for a run. I'm going to find a way to channel that emotion. Because when we don't channel emotions, they get kind of held up in the body and they can also cause disease. And so that's like the aspect of like emotional eating. But um, I worked, when I first started my career, I worked with um, 
I worked at a weight loss clinic with physicians and they really didn't understand honestly how to delicately deal with people who have eating disorder like behavior. You can't also just um, tell them they can't have anything or start restricting them or start giving them really low calories. You have to be mindful of that. When you push back on someone who is overeating or binge eating, you're actually going to encourage that behavior. And so instead they should be encouraged to eat healthy food, make better choices, eat as much as they need to feel full, get in touch with their emotions, meditate. It's going to go to rewire your brain, change everything. All those things need to happen. Um, so those are some of the, the, you know, just the basic relationship with food. When I deal with the subconscious mind in my practice, I also deal with how some of these root behaviors and um, habits um, have gotten formed. And that can go pretty deep because then that goes to, and that, that ties into some of the things that um, Dr. Baptiste was talking about with trauma. I mean, black people have an extraordinary amount of trauma, but even just as human beings, when we're young, we get trauma then informs how we behave the rest of our natural lives. And we don't even know that we're on autopilot. So part of my job as a behavior coach is also to identify those things and disrupt them so that my clients can actually follow the plan we give them. And they're not gonna sabotage them. Mm, wow. So, so I mean, again, at the individual level, we're having to dig pretty deep into an individual psychological issues, and 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 Columbus, you're talking about a psychosocial aspect of things, and so so bring us back to the, the slave food, and and uh, tell us about. Somebody asked online, when will it be out? Uh, what give us a, a picture of the timeline. Of the documentary, we we had a talk off uh, offline about this, and you, you got a whole lot. It's a pretty ambitious project. Yeah, but share some of that with us. Yeah, right now I'm I'm seeing it's not anything that's going to turn around next year or later up part of this year and be be ready, um, because we want to do it right, and we want to dedicate enough time to each what we're calling episodes. That's hence the docu series. But just to, to highlight, I, what I will tell you is that what you said, though, earlier was very, very powerful in terms of your approach with the patients. And in a business model, this is something that we use on a regular basis, which is stop, challenge, and choose, right? You, and you apply that in multiple entity aspects, and that's really what you're speaking to. And so on an individual basis, you're absolutely right. And so the docu-series is to hopefully bring awareness to 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 people that there may be other reasons as to number one, why there's the health disparities, number two, why we're choosing to eat. So it's not only just the choices. So this is what uh, Baxter, you and I were speaking about. Oftentimes we say, make better choices, eat better foods, right? But when I grew up in an environment where I immediately develop a brand recognition because all that's around me are fast food establishments, convenience stores that are laden with highly processed refined foods that are cheap, get five for one dollar because they're subsidized by the government. And these eight and these these fast food establishments oftentimes may have small business association loans, which make it more favorable for them to be inside these communities that happen to be, coincidentally, communities of color. And then you have an absence of healthy food options that are there. And we say make better choices where you have still, you have a segment of the population who don't have readily, read, readily access to cars. So they still take public transportation. So their ability to shop and carry on multiple bags is limited. And so I think it's important to understand that, yes, we recognize that it's not so simple as just do it. I'm gonna give you an example. I'd mentioned I, start, I, I was uh, spending the weekend down in San Diego, uh, Dr. Atkins, and specifically I was in La Jolla. Uh -huh. And we stayed down in Del Mar. Now, take this for instance. I told you all how I had to drive about 20 to 25 miles to get to a grocery store. Literally within about a mile radius, there was a Sprouts, which is a very nice high-end mm -hmm. uh, yeah. uh, grocery store. Mm -hmm. Within there, a Whole Foods. And across the street from a Whole Foods, we had another specialty store called Gelson's. <coughs> Wow. And I didn't mention that there was a Vons and other grocery stores all here. Literally, I walk and hit grocery stores that are very high 
standard grocery store. And you go in communities where you don't have access to that, and we wonder why people are having issues that are there, and we're subsidized. And so that's where I think it's important to understand, because many times inside of our area, we, we speak from a, a high horse, from our soapbox, and we say, be whole food plant-based. It's simple, it's affordable, get out there and just do it. And it's it's important to recognize where people are living, where they're coming from. And that oftentimes that progression, they have to be committed, but we have to walk them through like a marathon, I believe, personally. Right? So a marathon, 26.2 miles, I'm not going to have you run 26.2 miles tomorrow for every person. Now, some people might be able to run half of it, some people three quarters, some people the whole length. But many people, it's only 100 feet. And I can't, I can't minimize their efforts. I have to encourage it with love yes. to push them along towards that goal. But here's the key. Their goal is not one mile. Their goal is not two miles. Their goal is not 10 miles. Their goal is 26.2 miles. Right. And, we, and our goal is to keep our eyes on that goal as we move towards it. And it's okay to, to take a little bit uh, a longer time because yeah. we're all at different points on this journey. Wow, that's amazing. Go ahead. I really Go ahead. appreciate that you, I feel like a lot of physicians don't understand the power of the words that they speak to people. Um, and I really feel like you understand that and that you are understanding that you need to integrate inspiration um, and some sort of coaching. This is kind of what I do and people come to me for this, but they also come to me with these stories of physicians or health professionals who have said things to them that were highly insensitive and or just really just not inspiring, like really depressing, like literally they come like so many black women in my practice are just like, they told me I will never have a kid or just crazy stuff where I'm like, I don't really think they should have said that. Like they could have <laughs> just been like, you have a fibroid ma'am and like, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I really think what you're saying is super important because people, the mind is such a powerful thing. Like they, they've shown that like, you can say to someone, you have three months to live. And if that person takes that and believes it in their subconscious mind, they will die. But if they, there are those people, people like me who are really strong willed, and you say that to them, they're like, actually, I'm gonna be great. And then they go, <laughs> they go off and find people like you and they get on a plane for night and they live their best lives, right? So I, I just thought that was a really powerful and important thing because I think that health professionals have to be very careful with how you speak to patients, you speaking life into people. No, I appreciate that. So I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'll tell you. We have to we have to all look within ourselves and how we respond to other people and how we treat. And so I'll tell you, I, I'm not always always I'm perfect. You know, I just asked my wife. I'm I'm absolutely not perfect. And so I never forget going into a patient's room. I was double booked. I had meetings to go to, administrative meetings, and it's my last patient in the morning before I needed to get out. I walked in the room. And this person looked disheveled. They smelled of cigarettes. And I was meeting them for the first time. And I, I looked and I was somewhat abrupt with them and going through. And I said, you know, sir, I think you're going to have to have surgery. You're going to have to, we're going to do an angiogram. We're going to have to do bypass. We're going to have to go in. This is me knowing that I want to deliver the message of health to patients. Yeah. This is me, right? But this is my response to this individual in that moment. The guy, and I'm looking at my computer typing more than I'm looking and engaging him in that moment. And never forget that this man looked up at me and he said, Da, is there anything else I can do? I remember pausing for a moment and looking over at him and almost sarcastically saying, yeah, you can go on a whole food, uh, plant-based diet, mostly raw, no, uh, uh, no oil, no salt, no sugar, and maybe you'll have a chance. And I turned around and kept going. The words that came out of his mouth were, okay. The words that came out of his mouth were okay. I stopped. It hit me over the head and I was ashamed of myself in that moment. I was ashamed. I told him so. And I sat and I said, the heck with whatever meaning I have. And we had a long conversation. 
And this man went on to kind of transform his life. And what that taught me was, it's not up to me to judge. It's not up to me not to deliver a message of hope, a message of health, a message of wellness to every patient every time. I have to get over myself, right? And my needs and my desires, because this is what I chose to do in life, right? And so that I say that story, even though it doesn't make me appear very fondly, is because all of us are flawed and all, we're all going to have moments but I think the key is we all have to be introspective enough to recognize that where maybe I'm not my finest self. I'm not the finest version of myself today and call us, put our own selves on task with it. And that whether or not we, ch we choose and we're starting down this road and, and our awareness is minimized, right? right? Our awareness of why we're eating the way that we're eating, why we're choosing to eat because we're frustrated or we're angry or we're, we're upset, right? Um, why we're not drinking our water, why we're not remaining active, why we're not getting our rest. All these variables become important for all of us and not, we have to avoid the what the hell moment. You know, yeah. and say, oh, oh, I'll start next Monday. I'm gonna start, I'm gonna start on January 1st or I'll start after, after Halloween. We have to avoid that moment and just yeah. say, you know what, next meal, next moment, I'll be better. Wow, that's impressive. You know, a couple of things I want to touch on uh, as we wind down um, is that, and I know I'm probably feeding the feedback. I've changed my different mics and speakers already. I'm just going to turn my speaker down. Are y'all hearing the feedback now? Yes. I'm trying to, is it really bad? Same. I think something's turned. I should shut up, perhaps. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> let, let me, I'll speak softly. Let me just turn my speaker down some more. Uh, and at least it's not reverberating between my mic and speaker. Is that a little bit better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Anyway, a couple of things. I mean, and, and I think you touched on it some promise, you know, driving the distance, you know, and finding the supermarkets. One of the solution I think we have is we need to start to look at building institutions. You, you started out with your cardiac rehab. Um, and so I think that, you know, what I found in my practice when I started early, I would write down recipes and give it to patients and they would follow up, but then you have to build more and more programs to give more and more support. And so now when I rush into the room with a patient and I counsel them, and yes, you need to be on the raw detox, well, what we do is we have a restaurant right there, we have the food, and so I bring them a sample platter right there and there. And the food talks to them in ways I cannot talk to them. And and then, you know, my nutritionist comes in, and so we have a whole team approach. And so I may be rushing around, but there's a team approach where, okay, you need to do a raw detox, what's that? Okay, here's what that, try this, eat that. And, and we have a nutrition clinic and so on. Uh, and we actually expand our restaurant to a grocery store. So the next phase is to actually control all of the food that they have. Because even when you go to these uh, uh, so um, so called you know healthy restaurants, they still have junk. Cool. And people go to these places and there's junk there. And so you know we've created a model of, of the of the nutrition center of the future where there's no junk. And so. I think a lot of this has to do with us having to build institutions because the bad food institutions are there and they have to be counted from an institutional standpoint. And um, and I, I'm glad to see you've done the, the documentary. Things like that, messaging from an institutional standpoint is, is going to be the next avenue that, that we're going to have to take up. Um, as we go through the final minutes, uh, I want to share those one uh, person that submitted a question. Uh, and uh, normally I email this to everybody. I'll just read it out. Uh, I'm 44 years old. Uh, you saw the Afro Vegan Conference. Uh, I've been reading a lot about keto and intermittent fasting. I was wondering what your thoughts were about vegan keto diet with intermittent fasting for African Americans. Also, what are your thoughts on integrating apple cider vinegar with intermittent fasting and vegan keto? Anybody want to tackle that in the last you know few seconds? <laughs> Huh. <laughs> um, if no one has anything, I'll say something. All right. Yeah, go ahead. It's awesome. 
I mean, there's so much more about that person I would need to know in order to like really know what kind of diet might be integral for them. Intermittent fasting has so much research behind it and it's really great for longevity. It's great for so many things, weight loss, maintenance, all the stuff. So intermittent fasting, no problems there. Keto, you actually can do vegan keto. You might have to take a lot of MCT oil or something. Um, but I just, my problem with the keto diet, honestly, I had a, I had a, CNS mentor who actually wrote like a whole paper on keto diets and all the different uses and et cetera. And I remember, you know, the most useful things I know it for are Alzheimer's, seizures, certain things where the brain really does need to be, <coughs> it can't process glucose. So it needs to be running on them fats. I My problem with keto as as a you know because people are kind of doing it as a fad and they're not really understanding their bodies their condition and how that works with it is that it's very restrictive and so people will get on it and then they'll get off and they sort of be on it and that also causes problems for them health-wise too because they're like yo-yoing between <laughs> sort of being in ketosis you know what i mean so um I just don't think it's, I don't know why you're doing this, but I think there are other more sustainable ways to achieve whatever your health goals are than just jumping on a keto bandwagon. And you should probably consult with someone that can help you understand what the diet and, you know, best diet is for your body. Yeah, yeah. I, I put it that keto is not a, it's, it's the fact, it's not a diet, it's not a lifestyle. So the main thing is you have to adopt something that's going to be a lifestyle that you're going to live with, not just be on it for a while. I'll just throw in there my hat in the ring too as well. I think what you said is important is that it's first important to understand what's your why. Why are you asking about whatever it is that you're asking? If your question is about weight loss, is it about weight loss or is it about prevention of disease or reversal of disease? And those are distinctly different because if it's about diet, if it's about weight loss, there's a thousand and one ways out there to achieve weight loss. Yeah. But if it's about diet, if it's about improvement of chronic lifestyle preventable diseases, then that's a separate question. Um, I can infer that maybe there's a component of weight loss, hence the apple cider vinegar, unless it's about related to diabetes. And maybe there's some, you know, if, if you've read about some, some benefit of apple cider vinegar and diabetes, but generally most folks look into that apple cider vinegar if they're speaking about weight loss. Um, so that becomes important, but I would likewise encourage you to, to consider real food, whole food, not process, not vegan, right? I'm not pro vegan. I'm not anti vegan, but I'm not pro vegan. I'm pro real food, whole food, plant rich foods is what becomes important, not the label of vegan. Yeah, I agree with the labeling. I think that that's an important thing because labels are misleading and people assume that vegan is healthy and it's not. Uh, you can consume a vegan diet and triple your cholesterol uh, worse than somebody eating steak and eggs. And so, uh, it, it's it's about like you say the quality of the food and and we try to emphasize that in our program uh, with the food classifications. And one last word on intermittent fasting is that we all intermittently fast because whenever you sleep you're fasting, and so you know a good night's sleep. There are, there are many benefits of sleeping, and one benefit is the fasting state. And so you know the, the whole thing of well you know should I intermittently fast? Well, yes, you should. I mean that's a natural part. And 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 so when we intermittently fast, we probably extend our fasting to say a greater period of time than the 24-hour period, or we may do consecutive days of fasting. But we're already intermittently fasting as it is. So it's it's so intermittently fasting. I think is always healthy. <laughs> that's right. So that's it's right. good. Yeah. Hey guys, Baxter, I just wanted to yes. say uh, with the alkaline, with the uh, as the apple cider vinegar, a lot of times it's used to alkalize to to um, promote more of a higher you know alkaline diet, and that could be anti-inflammatory. So you know, doing a tablespoon of apple cider vinegar and a glass of water in between meals seems to be good. You always should rinse your teeth so it's not it has acidic properties on the teeth, but be alkalizing, but you know, I think the, the benefit, I mean, you're trying to extend that anti-inflammatory effect that you get from green vegetables and eating the raw diet, et cetera. And, uh, but I, I agree, it is difficult to stay on a, um, 
a ketogenic diet. And uh, but I think an alkaline anti-inflammatory diet is 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 uh, the key. And uh, we just have to change our thinking towards uh, all the inflammatory things like the meat and the sugar and uh, replace them with things that we can be satisfied with. And Baxter, you're on mute. Yeah. <laughs> I guess the gods are speaking to you, Baxter. He, de he doesn't realize he's on mute. Oh. Yeah. He does. Dr. Dr. Montgomery's over here recording his hip hop album. Well, like, behind <laughs> I, I just muted myself. Sorry for that. Anyway, that's the last word. <laughs> we got a, um, but but the, the, the last question, uh, Columbus, when is slave food coming out? Is, that, is it a, a year from now? Or that's the most common question, God. You know, what I would say is that if I'm all things, if I'm hopeful that we're saying by 2022, if all things are hopeful, it will be 2022. Okay. So it, it will, it definitely will not be next year. Okay. Because okay. Well, if hey. we wanted to, COVID wouldn't allow next year. Mm. Gotcha. Gotcha. Well, okay. We'll take that, but uh, maybe that's something we can do to help you on. But Anyway, thank you guys. It's a great show tonight. Uh, Columbus, thanks for taking and you're on vacation this week. I want everybody to know that you took some time from your vacation to come and be with us. And, and uh, this is really a joy. And uh, uh, we're going to have to, you and I are going to have to uh, connect some more down the, the road. I, I, I've seen on documentaries, but now we've connected uh, somewhat in person for the first time. And I hope yeah. we won't uh, uh, be strangers anymore. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, uh, it's also Floyd, Pam, for being on tonight. And, and of course, thank you guys, uh, our guests. Uh, we want to thank uh, all of you guys for joining us. And uh, until next week, we want you to you know, keep it fresh, natural, and live. And uh, next week, we'll be talking about dementia. Uh, and uh, we're going to have a case presentation and go through all of that uh, information on dementia with you. So stay tuned, please uh, subscribe and share the information from the show. Uh, and I'll see you next week. Thank you very much.